poverty has never been a path to prosperity. This is the business of architecture. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for building and managing an architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. I'm joined today by my co-host and our Director of Client Fulfillment here at Business of Architecture, Mr. Ryan Willard. And this month's winners of entry into the 200 Club are Drew and Justin Tindall, Chris Brandon, Ramiro Torres, Mark Elster, Sven Levine, Charles Graham, Yos Bende, Thomas Norton, Molly Willlock, Ian and Tony Wilson, Jeff Frame, Ryan Solars, and Irene Adams. Well done, guys. Keep it up. Ryan, how are you today? I'm fantabulous. Thank you, Enoch. That is so great to hear. Back in London, you had a stint in in uh, in Manhattan. You were over here for a little. Actually, you were in California for a bit, traveling with me. So, one thing that our podcast listeners may not know is that Ryan runs most of our client facing programs. So, if you join one of our programs here at Business of Architecture, you will likely be working with Ryan directly. He is uh, a magician, and our clients absolutely love him. They love the insights he brings. They're challenged. They're stretched, and certainly they get excellent results under his wise counsel and tutelage. So, he's been doing a, quite a bit of traveling. Ryan, you were out here in. California for a bit, which is awesome. We got to hang out, drive my convertible up to the uh, up to the giant redwood trees, and had a grand old time, didn't we? We absolutely did. I loved it. Yeah, and along the way, you got to visit a lot of BOA clients, business of architecture clients, who are member firms that we work with in our programs, and and then of course in in Manhattan we had Andre Soleri who organized this wonderful roundtable about the idea of architect developer, and we were able to hold that special event. Now, speaking of events, you had the opportunity recently to participate in, so the title of the topic today for today's episode is Justifying Financial Mediocrity in Architecture, and we're going to describe what we mean by this. When we talk about justifying mediocrity in architecture, we're not talking about design mediocrity, we're not talking about mediocrity and sustainability. We're not talking about mediocrity in any of these other categories, although certainly these things might exist in architecture, and certainly they do. Ryan recently was asked to come give a presentation as part of uh, an event put on by Reba, the Royal Institute of British Architects, called Guerrilla Tactics, which is their 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 initiative aimed at smaller smaller practices, small firms, which I think is great that they even have this. So now, Ryan, when you got there, tell us about your experience because it was it was very interesting to see the overall narratives and things that were happening at this event, your perspective, what you shared at that event, the reactions mm-hmm. that you got. And really it was a bit, it was kind of an opportunity for you to kind of take the pulse of the architectural narrative, particularly regarding finances and the business of architecture over there in London, the UK. Is it primarily London-based practices or do you have other practices that travel to go to an event like that? There there would have been practices from all over the country that would have come, but the architecture scene in London is very London-centric. I mean, in the UK is very London-centric, so it would have been a lot easier for practices who were based in London just to come down. But there certainly would have been a handful of practices that came from further afield. Again, it's not like the US where it takes 18 hours to get somewhere by car. It's, it's exactly. a lot easier to it's a lot easier to travel around or come down from another city on the train. Now, what did, what did Reba ask you to come in and speak on? And what did you end up speaking on? So the, the way that this particular event works is that it's, it is um, curated by a kind of guest, if you like, who's another architect. Um, and the Reba kind of facilitate it and sell tickets and, um, and have, it, have, it, have it on, if you like. They do this thing, the initiative every, every year. And so I was invited to give the keynote to kind of open it up. And I was asked to inspire the audience. So when I was first asked to come, I was I, with, the, with the RBA um, team, Part of the brief, if you like, was to inspire and to kind of prep the audience for the wonderful speakers that were going to be uh, participating throughout the rest of the event. I was There was a discussion at the very beginning where I was asked to make it okay, and I'm paraphrasing here, so I apologize if I don't get the, the accuracy, but this is my interpretation of what was said, okay, um, was was that it was it's okay not to grow that was the message 
okay, to, to validate. They were barking up the wrong tree. They, 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 were, they, they were validating it's okay not to grow. So it's like and, telling Elon Musk that it's okay not to launch rockets to the moon. Exactly, exactly. I mean, at the time, I said, when you say it's okay not to grow, do you mean that we can redefine growth for ourselves as individual practices and understand what success looks like in an individual practice? Yes, 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 that's what we mean. Okay, fine. Now, my the event was, was very well curated. There were some great speakers and some good insights of practices of what they're actually doing. And, you know, there were some good details and good practical resources and, and examples. I think that's what I liked the most about this particular event is that it's real practices talking about what they're actually doing in their business and how it works and kind of opening up the, the hood of the car, if you like, and showing a bit of the inner workings. Fantastic. Great. The thing that I would be critical of it and the, what I wanted to talk about and how I kind of opened the event was very simple, was that architects need to be focusing on money. That's it. We need to focus on money. We need to focus on making profit. That needs to become a priority in every single person who dares to open an architecture practice. And I want to pause you there, Ryan. Here's, here's my suspicion, and you tell me if this is correct or incorrect, but my suspicion is... Well, first of all, there's always the unsaid that's behind the said. In other words, whenever someone says something, there's always something that someone else is thinking about. My suspicion is, is that when you, if you said that, even right now on the podcast, when you said that architects need to be focused on money, there may be some people who their mind instantly goes to, that means they shouldn't be focused on the architecture. They shouldn't be focused on delivering good quality for their clients. So let's make a distinction there. Is that what you're saying, Ryan? Are you saying that we should focus not, exclusively on the money and forget the clients and forget the architecture? Not at all. Not at all. What What do you mean? So, I'm. What I mean. No, is, let, let me ask you this: Have you? What do you? Th can you confirm or deny that this is a narrative that people generally pick up when you say this? Because you said this at the event. What's your opinion on on how people took that or take this statement? In general, when I say this statement or when I talk about focusing on profit people often look at me as if I'm some kind of greedy capitalist who's looking to make a quick buck at the expense of everybody else or looking... all those interns who are working late into the night yeah, oh they... wait wait that already happens and it's industry standard oh interesting yeah <laughs> exactly or that I'm advocating that architects do terrible work and pursue projects um, that are of poor design quality or that you focus solely on serving the rich and the, the high net worth individuals of the world and do and again and by proxy when people say that they assume that all work that's done for wealthy people is disgusting uh, outlandish in poor taste gaudy and it's not what the world needs right, so that's and I mean I've even had people um, architects I admire who have written to me or DM'd me on Instagram who have said you really shouldn't be talking about architecture you should be talking more about beauty and form or go back to conversations about architecture and design I've had what you mean that you shouldn't be talking about money or what what do they mean yeah, you shouldn't be talking about money you shouldn't be talking ah, about okay. business yeah okay I've had uh, in an Instagram post a little while ago when I was talking about this very topic of how architects need to be focused on profit or how we can make more profit in our businesses, there was an accusation that I was somehow promoting that architects get involved with projects like, I think it's called um, Bibby Stockholm. Okay, and a Bibby mm. Stockholm, I don't know if you know this, it's a, it's a, a basically like a giant floating... Uh, porter cabin for immigrants and refugees okay so when people try and come into the UK um, and they're stopped at the borders they're getting put they get temporary housed in one of these big floating barges and it's a pretty bleak environment and 
I was, I mean, I'm, again, I was quite offended that somebody would even assume <laughs> that, that I don't, I don't Ryan, follow. You probably <laughs> killed, you probably killed puppies and you probably used to saw the heads off of Barbies when you were a child, didn't it, you? It, it was so ludicrous. It was such an absolute ludicrous statement that with that particular person who wrote me that, and they accused me of a whole load of, of types of, um, you know, prison types of projects or just projects that had a little moral compass to them that that's what that's what i was insinuating that architects should be doing and i mean yeah, I wrote, medieval medieval torture dungeons things like that i mean it, it, that's where it, all the it, let's face it, that's where all the money is i was just i was just i was advocating just setting fire to stuff and it was it was it was ludicrous it was a ludicrous set of um you know accusations and i i was very firm with my responses and again this could be the topic of another podcast um, uh, but I would I would say that well, number one project like Stocky, uh, like um, Baby Stockholm, probably doesn't even have architects involved in it. It was designed by engineers for a very functional purpose, and if an architect had been involved or should have been involved, then it would have been a much more humanistic approach. And it's exactly why architects should be, you know, focusing on profit so that they've got profit, so they can direct their attentions to designing proper, carefully thought out projects we look we, again they were the accusation there was that you know profit hungry architects are responsible for a, appalling housing that exists what are you talking about appalling housing exists now and most architects are not focused on profit yeah and, exactly and, and because they're not focused on profit guess what developers don't like hire the, hiring them to do the architecture so they don't and they just do cut and paste repeat and we get vast swathes of terrible housing across the planet you know architects were completely um impotent financially that, we're, yes, we're, yes. We're, we're completely illiterate financially for the most part and it cuts us out of all these conversations these important high level strategic financial conversations plus it stops us from earning any money so that we can't actually have any agency for all these things that we're waving banners for at the moment it's really really you know it's ridiculous and so we have Absolutely. all these we have all yeah. these conversations about diversity and inclusion in the profession and these are you know they're important topics but underpinning them all is economics and money Brian, can I pause you there for oh, well I'm Sorry. gonna pause you anyways okay <laughs> because you mentioned this we've had this conversation offline so it's very interesting, like, and we've had a conversation, we had Light Psycho on the podcast a while ago, but talking about this diverse, diversity and inclusion, you and I have discussed how one of the one of the best ways to get more diversity and inclusion into the architecture profession isn't by mandating policies, although certainly that can help. Ultimately, what would it look like if architecture actually became a highly profitable profession? And and I pointed, we pointed, I can't remember if it was on a video that I posted or something, but had a number of people who were foreigners or people who were non-native U.S. citizens or people who were of color. And they reached out and they said, thank you. Thank you. That's exactly it. Like I came from an environment where I didn't have money. And certainly I want to do good architecture and I'm drawn to the profession. But at the same time, to me, making money is important. So now here at Business of Architecture, you know, Ryan and I have decided to take a very, a very, very controversial stand. And we're probably going to get a lot of backlash because of this controversial stand. Very controversial. I mean, Ryan, we're really putting ourselves out here on a limb. And the controversial stand is this. Architects can be wealthy. And not only can they be, but they deserve to be. Now, I say that tongue-in-cheek, but isn't that interesting that that would be such a controversial position? Like, where are we at as an industry when the, the concept of making money becomes so inflammatory and controversial that Ryan and I become iconoclasts of the architecture industry simply because we say architects deserve to be paid handsomely for the work that they do? It's bonkers. It is. It's absolutely it's it's absolutely bonkers that this is the the state. So we do need to hold the mirror up and be very honest and truthful about what we're doing as an industry. And individually, look, the the RBA, the AIA, they're going to do their their bit, but they've got a different function to play. Quite honestly, and it's us as individual architects and practice owners to get intelligent about making money in the profession. 
and that is one of the most active things I think you can do if you want to make a stand on these on these types of topics then make your profession wealthy make yourself wealthy you don't have to do it at the expense of other people okay and if that is a belief that you have that you can only get wealthy through ex exploitation or the expense of other people then there's some work to do right there's a whole mental mess there of of false beliefs that are probably not even your own that you've inherited from somebody else maybe your family maybe other architects okay but they're massively unhelpful and the chronic financial position that the industry finds itself in right now where it is the one of it's one of the most easily exploited professionals on a job site you know you often see these kind of headlines that are talking about you know in the UK it was a little while back there was a headline that was the oh, architects the least paid person on the construction site okay and yeah we've allowed that to happen because we haven't focused on money we haven't focused on money and it is not a problem to focus on money or to make the profession a profit with purpose centric profession okay Exactly. Make, so Ryan, so you get in there. Money focused profession. So you walk in there. Okay. So what did you end up speaking about when you walked into this event? Well, Gorilla precise, Tactics. Precisely this. And yep. the, the the call, if you like, was number one for us to focus on profit and money. And there was I started off the conversation by discussing all the current problems that we've got in the industry in terms of lack of agency and, and just using some of the statistics that come from the RBA themselves beautifully compiled and curated and very thoughtfully laid out and diagnostically you know pulled apart if you like um, presented statistics on the state of the profession okay the companies that put those together they're, they're amazing they're absolutely amazing but they make for very sad reading right when, when you've got a situation in the UK where you've got sole practitioners on average taking home £25,000. Wow. What on earth now, 25, are you doing? Now, £25,000 is a king's ransom, though, in in the UK, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can live like you a... You live, live like a royalty. Like, exactly, exactly. You can just... Oh, beautiful, no, beautiful. It, it's, it is incredibly hard to live on £25,000 in the UK, and certainly in a okay. city like London, it is just above livable wage. That is diabolical. That is unacceptable. That is unacceptable. Well, and I mean, let's let's face it. I mean, it doesn't take much to become an architect. So I think the wage reflects the ex skills and experience of the architect, right? I mean, just a couple of months in a in a trade school, and you can have an architectural stamp and go out there and start designing skyscrapers, right? You can you can buy them online. Exactly for next to, for next to nothing, or do so it's, a... no, it's no wonder. There are there are video playlists on YouTube that help you become an architect. There you Absol go. Exactly. A, 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 absolutely right. It, it's 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 an enormous amount of energy. Everyone listening to this knows and appreciates the huge resource that goes into becoming an architect. Huge and the resource love. and the love. The love, the sweat, the tears, the pain, the money that either you put in or you borrow or your parents put in. The time. You know, these are the formative years of your life where you could have been out actually earning money in whatever career you chose, and you're not. You're s still studying at university, which is kind of warping our minds in a certain direction, sometimes for the good, sometimes it's making us even more detached from economic reality. Um, and at the end of it, you come out of this huge, you've invested this huge amount of resource into, and then, what, then, then look at the reality of it. That is why people do not join the profession. That is why women leave when they want to raise families. Or, or you know, th this is this is just one of the biggest challenges to the profession. And we're all responsible for it because if you're not tracking your profit, if you're not setting yourself stretch stretching financial goals, okay, goals that make you, you know, if if you set yourself a financial goal and you are having all this kind of mental resistance to it. Like oh that's that's a terrible god that's evil that's not great you're on the right you're in the right track here okay because then you can start to, then at least you can start to become an observer of all of the mental friction and resistance and start under unpick, unpicking it because it's lies 
Stop exactly. Me I mean, on, on, on one of our client calls earlier today with our design council group, which is our highest level of architectural practice owners that we work with. When I say highest level, I mean most financially successful. They have large teams doing quite impressive projects, but doing great work as well. And one of these owners shared his kind of short-term um, financial goal, which was to hit a million dollars. And there are people on this call that are bringing home a million dollars. Uh, the previous pod, one of the previous podcast episodes, Ryan, that I did recently was with an architect and I asked him how he told me that he makes five, he brings home half a million dollars. And he's like, but he says, I'm not going to say that on the podcast. Okay. So I can't, it's like, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually embarrassed to reveal it to other people because it's just, it's, it makes for awkward conversation. Right. So, okay. So you're there, you're at this event. How many people showed up to the event? Was it a, a group of 30, 40, 60? Uh, probably, about, was the, probably about 200 people. Oh, quite large then, 200 people. So you get in, you get them riled up talking about this idea that architects deserve to be wealthy and that wealth and good design are not contradictory. They're not yeah. They're not on opposite sides of the spectrum. Absolutely. I, being highly I, compensated. I walked them through the evolution of an architect, the, the free architect journey. Oh, from, beautiful. From becoming you know, the <laughs> artist all the way to the investor. And one of the things I introduced was a new benchmark. Okay, now this is something that we're so used to talking about. We've had podcasts on it. But when we introduce the idea of a new benchmark and that perhaps the benchmarking systems that we've been using in the past that the RIBA produced and the AAA produced, well, we're actually benchmarking ourselves against a low-performing industry, like a poor-performing exactly. industry. If we started to benchmark ourselves against lawyers... What do you think is going to happen? Mm. You know, or we benchmark ourselves against any other kind of profession or, you know, if we, maybe if we benchmarked ourselves against academics, I don't know, then we might be I in the same. I think we might have one up on them and, and um, <laughs> um, f wedding photographers as well. <laughs> <laughs> academics and wedding photographers. All right, Ryan. So the, now you saw something interesting there, which was, and you, you mentioned this earlier, which was like this defending the mediocrity, defending mm -hmm. my uh, fight, justifying financial mediocrity in architecture. Tell me about mm -hmm. that. How'd that come up? What so, does that, what does that mean? So first of all, just going to go back to that, the benchmarking. Okay. Cause there was interesting after okay. I'd given the talk and there was a lot of people that were intrigued by it. They were like, wow, we've never seen anything like that. And then there was other practices that were saying, how? How is that even possible? So both of those reactions are totally expected and I think are great. At least someone's looking at it and going, wow, I've never seen anything like that. How is that possible? Wait a minute, this isn't what the RBA or the AIA has been telling us before. We've been, we've been looking at what other underperforming practices are doing. Okay, so fine, great. I'm glad that that was a bit of a surprise and a different a different benchmark. Likewise with the idea of making 30% profit, where the industry has very much become resigned with, oh, you know, 7 or 8% profit on 10, 11, 12 if we're doing well. Okay, that's all too common, something that's just accepted as, as normal. Now, the justifying the mediocrity, there was some very good um, Q&A sessions that were, that came up afterwards. I wasn't I wasn't invited to speak on the Q and A sessions. I don't. I don't know if I. Why not, I missed, Ryan? I, I don't know. I don't know. I like to think it was because I was a troublemaker, but I don't think it was. I think it was. It just got overlooked. Overlooked. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I did find myself in the audience listening to some of the uh, the answers that were the practice owners were giving, and having a very visceral reaction of no, 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 no. That is not how I would answer that question. There's a different way of looking at this. And one of the questions was about, was about can, can profit and growth or being focused on profit and growth, can that cause, can that cause problems or can it, or doing it too much, can it, can it, you know, become a really bad thing for a practice? And everyone said, absolutely. Absolutely. You've got to be careful when focusing on profit. I mean, and let's face it, those, those bags of gold become quite heavy. Yeah, you, you, could, you could strain yourself. You don't want to make too uh, much money. And what are some yeah. of the other negative? Ad I mean, paper cuts of counting all those dollar bills or all those pound notes. I mean, this just is... all the, it's just when you look at your phone and there's too many zeros. 
on the on the it's app quite str- quite stressful strains the eye quite stressful yeah so, i mean i i get it i get it 100 percent. let's steer far far clear from any sort of profit yeah i mean a, a more honest answer would be <laughs> would be it's difficult to deal with the you know you might have to deal with the guilt of being wealthy when loads of your contemporaries are not making money okay that might be something that 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 might have been a bit more of an honest response but i found that not of not a very good answer and if i was there i would have said no like we've got to grow up here nobody in this room nobody who's running any kind of architecture practice except maybe acom or gensler okay oh you're gonna throw gensler under the bus huh okay all you gensler listeners here we go aecom these these guys those guys are at the level of kind of corporate of of a, being a corporation they're big big organizations oh i see what you're saying i right, thought you were right. going a different direction i thought you were no, about no. to to call out the giant uh greedy behemoths of the industry <laughs> right so the idea that you know the the profit often gets a bad name when we look at large corporate organizations that have been operating in a very short term set of cycles trying to please stakeholders and they've got themselves into you know they haven't been aware of what their relentless profit making and this makes poor business sense you know i've heard of many organizations um who the only way that they could maintain their promises to stakeholders and to shareholders of continued growth is to is to acquire more businesses and they go on this rampage of acquiring businesses that they've got no idea how to run and organize and whilst for the first year the profits increase and the growth increases give it two three years later and it's very irresponsible and it's long term very dangerous and difficult and it causes a big mess and businesses and then thousands of people lose their jobs and the the repercussions are far far worse and so we see those kinds of narratives coming out and and seeing but we're not talking about unrelentless profit making like that in architecture we're small businesses even the biggest businesses like the Gensers and the Acom they're still small organizations when we compare them to fortune 500 companies or corporate world you know a small business usually is defined of anything under about 30 million dollars pounds in in turnover which would include pretty much every single architect practice that you can imagine we're a small business so we don't have this worry about unrelenting profits we don't we have a problem of not focusing on on profit making well and what's so funny about that Ryan is it almost seems ludicrous because the practices in architecture that get such a bad rap that we know are exploitative. In other words, low wages for early young professionals, people working overtime and not being paid, things that we hear about happening in many of the Star Architects office where it's just a sweatshop. I mean, a lot of people who've gone out of very highly prominent offices talk about how it's a complete sweatshop. It's like, well, like you mentioned, these pro- these practices, they're not that profitable. Yeah, some are, really, some aren't. They're, you know, they're so not it's even not making like, that much money. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's not like not having profit makes everything suddenly equitable and and um um wonderful. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And if we were to look at the 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 kind of benchmarking ratio to some of these companies that are making people work um, insane hours, and we did it as a full time equivalent employee statistic, not bums on seats, then we'd see a very different picture of how poorly performing a lot of them are. And we've done this exercise before when we've looked at top firms, you know, Mm -hmm. top firms. And normally that means how many bums on seats they've got and the money that they're making. And you can often see quite a poor um, ratio, like a a poor performance, because people are working a huge amount of hours. They are paying people quite, quite lowly. And maybe there are there are big numbers coming out of individual projects, but then it will probably be a little bit distorted between who actually gets any access to that cash anyway and maybe you might have one or two people who get paid well and then the rest of the the rest of the organization doesn't really profit from it it doesn't it doesn't go anywhere i look at a practice where i was at like rshp where it was very different type of culture and i remember once there was a there was a i remember someone telling me whether this is true or not i'd have to do a bit of research on it but i remember somebody talking about in the past there was a AJ top 100 table and Foster's and Rogers, they made the same amount of profit, like numerical value, okay? They both made 
two million pounds profit or whatever it was. And it was interesting because one practice had 1,500 people and the other one had 150 people. And you were like, hmm. Amazing. Amazing. wonder which one I'd like to work for. So if any of you want to fact check that, feel free. Uh, the, 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 um, as always on this podcast, we say, don't believe anything we say. Now for our published reports and things like that, absolutely. Those of you who listen to the podcast, you know, we're much more about experience here, general ideas, philosophies, and things that we see. Absolutely. My disclaimer. Was that good, Ryan? That was, that was that good to keep us out of trouble in case that, that story was a little off. (laughs) <laughs> exactly exactly that's why i was i was being d- deliberately broad with the the details about it but i've i have heard that on numerous occasions from people but i've never actually gone and done the the research myself onto what the exact numbers were though i have downloaded um companies house reports from fosters before and had a good look through those which make for mm. interesting reading so kind of coming back to this idea then that there's a justification of mediocrity or a justification of financial mediocrity. This is what begins to happen, is that these sorts of benchmarks, like a, an, a, like a, a high-performance benchmark that, like we have here at Business of Architecture with the 200 Club, immediately, as soon as a practice sees a number like that, there is a justification for why they are not at it. And usually that justification is things that are out of their control. Exactly. Everything but us. Ryan, I got an email, and I got an email from a practice down, and she may be even listening to this podcast, so this isn't meant as a personal attack. Take this with a grain of salt. But she had reached out, and um, she was wanting to get some of our consulting services, and I said at the the moment we don't work with... um, uh, practices based in Australia just because of the time zone, because everything we do is very personal. And so, you know, our team is based in the UK and, uh, and the United States. And, uh, she kind of explained some of the challenges that she's facing, uh, the similar challenges that small practices face general sense of overwhelm, sense of not having enough time to do everything that needs to be done, poor profit margins, instability in the pipeline. And, and so after I told her that, you know, we weren't going to be able to work together, but I, I did have someone I could refer her to. She wrote back and she said, well, I just heard the, I just heard the podcast episode where you talked about the 200 Club. And she said, we're at, I can't remember the number she said. I think she said like we're at 120 or something like that. We're at 120, so we're, we're doing great. Or say we're doing good. And I, I was kind of scratching my head there for a second. US dollars like, or Aussie dollars. Interesting. Well, you know, I think the exchange rate, I'm not sure what it is. But in any case, <laughs> look it up. What is it, Ryan? I forget. It's been a while. Um, I think the U.S. dollar is worth more than the Aussie dollar, but I think the it is, point yeah. was, is I was I was quite surprised that that she felt like one hundred twenty thousand dollars, whether it's Australian, which I'm sure is what she was using, which is fine because it's you know it's by country by country, you know it's the the exchange rate doesn't come into it. What I mean by that is like even in Australia, if they're making two hundred thousand Australian dollars, then that's probably a very sufficient benchmark. But I thought I thought how interesting that instead of focusing on the gap of like, oh my goodness, like, wow, there's so much more we could achieve here. It was, it, it felt like, and perhaps I'm wrong, but it felt like a bit of complacency, like, oh, well, so we're not that far off. 120 Aussie dollars is 77,000 US dollars. Ooh, ooh, so that's even, that's half yeah. of US dollars. So in other words, the $200,000 benchmark, US benchmark would probably need to be, and I know the cost of living isn't that much less expensive in Australia. No, so which I mean, means that the I, benchmark I, would need to go up. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Like, I mean, normally the way I phrased it yesterday in the UK was, you know, I stick with the two hundred thousand, two hundred club, but it's two hundred thousand US dollars, and which equates to one hundred sixty thousand pounds in the mm, UK. But 100, yeah. the one hundred sixty club doesn't have the same doesn't have the as doesn't good have a the ring. same ring. It doesn't the have the same, same ring. ring as two hundred club. So we keep it with the two hundred club, but we it is two hundred thousand. US dollars, but then convert it to your local currency. Yeah, here, here at Business of Architecture, we talk about something foundational, which is called the code. And the code is simply this, stop lying. That's the code, stop lying. Stop lying to yourself, stop lying about your business performance, stop lying about what's really happening. 
and there's a lot of lying happening. So for instance, it's easy and it's natural as a human being to ignore the signs that we are underperforming. It's uncomfortable. It's not good news. We don't want to hear it. If I look in the mirror, I may tell myself the story, well, my, my weight's not that bad. You know, I mean, I have a friend who's a foot doctor. You'd be surprised at when people finally decide to see the doctor. Like literally toes are already falling off. Their entire foot is gangrenous. And he just, he tells me, he's like, I don't get it. How could they not come in sooner when they start to show the first signs that their feet are basically starting to slough off? Well, Enoch, that's quite a that's quite a gory analogy. But is it really? Isn't that what we do financially in our practices and what we've done so long in architecture? Ryan, I was having a sales conversation earlier this week with a, a couple of gentlemen who reached out to me about about working with us. They'll remain nameless. But it was interesting because there was there was an owner who was older and then there was someone who was younger. And the older gentleman, every time he talked about something that wasn't really working well in the practice in the past, maybe extended hours they had to work, maybe inconsistent pipeline, maybe taking a loss some months, or having a gap in the projects that came in, he very quickly followed it up with some sort of statement along the lines of, but it always came back, or that's just what to be expected, or you know how the industry is, or it was a lot of justifying mediocrity, which is exactly what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. So I thought it was so interesting. And so as we as we talk about this concept with you, our listener here, we just want to kind of put out a bit of a question to you, have you think about it right now, which is, have you seen this either in yourself or what's your opinion on this? Uh, is this something that you think architects have? Now, I have a brother-in-law who's in the cryptocurrency industry. Before that, he worked for a large stock exchange and um, in the sales department. Anyways, he has a great saying he talks about, he calls... He, he talks about the idea that human beings have what he calls mind viruses. And I love that idea, a mind virus. So Ryan, you mentioned that in architecture, we have a lot of financial beliefs that we haven't even necessarily created, that we've just taken on without assumption. This is what we mean by mind viruses. We've taken on the belief that was handed down to us without questioning it. And I find that a lot of architects who've been in the industry a long time don't even question that things could be different. They don't question that perhaps it's not necessary to work overtime, Mm -hmm. that perhaps it's not necessary to undersell our services and compete on price alone. So maybe we didn't create this issue. You listening, perhaps you haven't, you haven't directly undervalued your services. Maybe you're not part of the problem, but all of us, need to be, we need to take ownership by the fact that we are in the architecture industry, that as a part of this, we we have ownership for these group narratives. Mm -hmm. And right now the group narrative of of one is generally that money is making money, takes away the focus from doing good architecture and they don't go hand in hand, that they're antithetical and that the way to do your best work is to try to be as efficient as possible because then we can just do more architecture. Well, there's a better way. The better way is what if you could charge substantially more fees and you could do less work because you were less financially pressed? What would happen in the architecture industry if suddenly it became a highly profitable profession? Like what if some of the best and brightest minds of the world started looking to become architects because it was so highly lucrative? What might happen then? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you look at the medical industry, it's great. I mean, unfortunately, the medical industry has been under its own pressure recently of, you know, insurance rates and practitioners and especially family doctors now certainly don't make what they used to. But by and large, people who immigrate to America from other countries, it's not uncommon for them, their children, they want to be doctors, they want to be lawyers for a reason. Yeah. Because they know that they want financial stability. I, I, th- I think that's what's interesting as well is that, you know, the, the other, when we compare ourselves to the other professions, accountancy, lawyers, doctors, the thing about a profession is that there's a structure to get somewhere. And the structure, by and large, leads you, it's not an easy, it's not easy to follow it necessarily, it's not without its challenges, but it's a clear structure. And if you follow the clear structure, then there's some predictable results that happen. And by and large, if you become a lawyer, 
um, if you become a doctor, there is some predictable half decent wages that you can you can get from them. And at the higher echelons of each of those careers, you can make some serious, serious money. And the industry, by and large, certainly with lawyers are a good example, they're, you know, they are, they're focused, they're focused on money. And there's different areas of law, like corporate law, or corporate commercial mergers and acquisitions and things like that, where you can be part of in incredibly large deals, and you can earn ser very serious money. Likewise, in medicine, becoming cardiologist or a specialist or a brain surgeon or something like that or going into your own private practice then there's there's you know you can make some serious cash out of doing it and architecture needs to be able to offer the same sorts of levels of bun abundance and wealth because guess what we're dealing with people the majority of our clients are either very wealthy or when we're working with development or developers they're making lots of money we're creating financial um, instruments or we're working of all sorts of caliber of different professions and businesses that can be massively profitable and then we're helping their businesses become more profitable with the with the architecture that we're providing and there needs to be an economic balance with doing that and being able to do the other sorts of work that might be more community based for example or that you want to have agency in Poverty has never been a path to prosperity. So one of the beautiful things about the world and human society is that we're continually evolving. We're continually learning the things that don't work. So it's not, you know, the, 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 the old guard of architects, it's not necessarily their fault that, that the industry is, we don't need to blame them or throw them under the bus for where the industry is today. Certainly, they made improvements on the industry based upon where their predecessors were at. Architecture's evolved a lot over the, the past 100 years. It's a very different profession today than it was before. So as humanity, you know, we're learning. We can look at things like wars and holocausts, and we can say, you know what? I think those things don't work very well. Because, <laughs> so, you know, I think, I think we tried that one. I think we as humanity tried that, and... It wasn't very good. Same thing goes for poverty. There have been a lot of social experiments where it's like, hey, let's go to poverty to, to prosper. We've seen it happen. We've seen it happen in the Soviet Union. We've seen it with Marxism. Marxism. We've seen it with communism. Now we look at China. They're becoming very wealthy. It's very interesting what China's doing because they're, they've invented a flavor of communism that includes capitalism mixed in as well, which basically capitalism, the idea that capital is used as a resource for production it's state capitalism isn't it really <laughs> indeed and i'm certainly it's not holding it up as a as a bright shining example of what to do because in terms of their civil liberties and things that happen over there from what i hear about human liberties that's a whole nother question but the question we're asking here is that we'd like to question is is this narrative true is it true that architects must shun wealth, that architects must eschew profit to be able to be morally aligned and ethically aligned with their values? Or is there a space for profitable and purposeful architecture? Can we stop justifying the mediocrity and let it flow under the bridge as something that we learned about and it's in the past now. And we're moving on to a brighter possibility for the wealthy architect and the impact that they can have in the world. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart.
to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.